Hello, hockey fans. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on what time you're watching this, and maybe even good evening. My name is Andy Zolch. I am the voice of the San Diego Gulls, and pleased to be joined by the president and CEO of the American Hockey League, David Andrews. David, thanks a lot for taking your time to chat with us today. Yeah, happy to be with you. So to give some backstory for fans, this is uh, just finishing up his 26th year as president and CEO of the American Hockey League. And I want to take it all the way back to year one. And when you first began, what were you wanting to accomplish as soon as you jumped into that role? What were some goals that you wanted to tackle as your first or second or third year? Well, that's, that's a great question. I, I came into the job in, uh, in 1994, but I had been uh, appointed in 1993. So I had a, I had a 12 month period where I was serving as general manager of, uh, of one of the teams in our league. And during that 12 month period, I was developing a strategic plan for uh, the first two or three years of, uh, of my presidency. So we had, we had a pretty clearly laid out plan early on that we, I mean, we were in uh, not great shape as a league. We were in a lot of very small markets. We were, we were losing NHL affiliations to the old International Hockey League in those days. And so we really were uh, focused on, on kind of strengthening our brand, but more importantly, strengthening our ownership, strengthening the markets we were in. Uh, one of the things that we needed to do was was to differentiate ourselves from the from the IHL in those days, and and to do that we we uh, and we wanted to really kind of uh, grab the niche side of the of the minor pro hockey business and and be completely uh, committed to player development for NHL teams, and uh, that was a game changer for us. We we built uh, our development rule into our collective bargaining agreement over the course of that first year, and. And as you know, the development rule sort of limits the number of older players and makes sure that every team in our league has uh, has 12 players dressed at least in every game that are who are really on entry level or just beyond entry level contracts. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the byproduct of that was the NHL team saw this league as, as a much better place to develop young players. And, and NHL teams are a big part of our business model, as you know. So attracting those teams to our league, creating a, an opportunity for the best young players in the world to play against each other. Uh, we changed the, the nature of the league in that, in that first year in terms of our product, uh, who we were and what our relationship was with the NHL. And at the same time began to move aggressively to try to move into some new markets and, and strengthen our ownership. So, I mean, that was the early, I mean, the early strategic plan was a survival plan. Our, our league was in tough shape and um, certainly a lot of people pulled together. We had 16 teams or 15 teams then, I forget, I think it was 16. And, uh, you know, we, I think seven or eight of them were in Atlantic Canada. So we, we were a very uh, uh, regionalized league in, in the eastern part of Canada and the eastern part of the United States. Um, but, you know, really, we were really just trying to grow our league and, and strengthen our league and build a, a stronger relationship with the NHL. There was so much that occurred during your time span. You talked about the growth of the league and talked about essentially overcoming the IHL to become the premier feeder team for NHLs. Uh, what were some surprises that you've had? And, and I'm not even talking early. It could have been five years ago. I mean, obviously, we can leave this year aside. But was there anything that maybe you didn't anticipate when you got this job? Well, uh, the, the first thing was that... that uh, you're not really allowed to do what I did with the development rule. It's, it needs to be collectively bargained. So uh, in my first year on the job, we ended up in front of the National Labor Relations Board. So that was a quick learning experience that uh, you can't unilaterally apply those kind of rules in the workplace. But uh, we managed to work our way through that with our Players Association. And I think, uh, you know, everything's a, everything's a learning experience. I mean, you, you really grow uh, through your time in the position and I think as you're there for a period of time and have a little bit of success as, as, the, as the president, you gain more trust from uh, the people that we work with, whether it be the NHL teams, the NHL itself, or, or our own ownership group. And the more trust you gain, the more opportunity you have to, uh, to be innovative and to, and to be creative and to try to drive the business further, uh, perhaps more quickly than you could otherwise. So. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I certainly learned early on was I, I needed to earn the trust of everyone that uh, that we related with, and uh, and that earning that trust would go a long way to helping us grow and help us be successful. Out of your tenure, and again, I, I will keep this year aside. Was there any decision that you remember 
being maybe your most difficult decision that you endured where the league could go one way or the other way and you were faced with a very tough spot? Well, we had we had kind of two periods like that. I mean, there, there's a lot of times in the, you know, it's a long period of time I've done this. So there were all sorts of difficult challenges along the way and all sorts of all sorts of victories and a few little defeats and a few sleepless nights and all of what you would expect. I, I think the, you know, one of the biggest challenges we had was, was in 2001 to uh, be able to negotiate the agreement that brought the International Hockey League's uh, top six teams into the AHL and and uh, and the IHL went out of business at that point. Um, that changed the face of our league. It strengthened our owners. It gave us some great markets. Uh, it changed our footprint geographically to take us out into the Midwest and actually as far as Salt Lake City in, in those days. And uh, really allowed us to kind of be, you know, corner the market on affiliation agreements. We were only one league. And, and that took us to a point where we could realistically envision ourselves matching up exactly in the number of teams with, with the National Hockey League, and which is where we are now, obviously. But 2001 was a, you know, it was a landmark year, and, and that was a landmark project to, to put together. Um, and the next one, and, and it was really challenging, and it's, it, it was certainly worth it, what was our move to the, to the Pacific Division, where you are. And, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a very challenging project and a challenging negotiation. And... Um, you know, as I say, it was, it was a, difficult, a difficult thing to achieve for all involved, but certainly well worth it. And if I look at our league today, uh, you know, the addition of the Pacific Division and, and a market like San Diego and, and others in that division in California led us to move into Arizona, led us to move into Colorado and next year into, into Nevada. So you can see the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of growth that we've had because of our move to the West and it gives us a national footprint in the United States and has brought us into some great markets and helped to grow the game. So uh, that was, you know, a great achievement on the part of a lot of people, not, not me. I just helped negotiate it and helped make it happen. But, um, you know, that, that was, uh, that was a, a difficult challenge because I think, you know, there was the possibility that, that the AHL could be damaged by the creation of a new league on the West Coast if we couldn't find a way to make it work. And, uh, you know, some of our, you know, some of our teams in the East probably weren't really that interested in, in having a, you know, a section of the league in California at that time. It was way outside of our normal thinking. So uh, it was challenging, but, but it's been fantastic. And uh, believe me, the opportunity to go out to California to games and the hope successful teams like yours uh it's been great for the league to put more of a, a focal point on the pacific division expansion what was the biggest obstacle was it getting everybody on board and making sure that everyone was on the same page or was there something else that uh was more daunting of a task for you to overcome well i mean the biggest challenge was that was that not all of the teams that wanted to uh, have american hockey league franchises on the west coast owned a ahl franchises and we weren't in a position to expand. We were, we were matching one-to-one -one at that point with NHL teams. And, uh, you know, teams like Anaheim were affiliated with, uh, with independent owners in our league at that time, uh, as was Phoenix, as was, uh, uh, as, you know, as it turned out, uh, uh, well, Phoenix and who else? Uh, Colorado and more recently Vegas. So all of, those, all of those teams that are now part of the Pacific Division, we had to find – people to sell teams to them who were willing participants in selling and, uh, and getting, at a, getting to a price that would work for the teams in the West Coast. So uh, it was, that was the biggest challenge was finding enough franchises and, and relocating that many teams at the same time uh, out of as many markets as we had. I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a simple procedure to, you know, to move six teams from where they were to new locations in, in, uh, in a pretty short period of time. Now, as you stand back and, and you look at how the Pacific Division has grown, I mean, on the initial move, uh, there was Colorado, no Tucson. And now you know, we're seeing Vegas, as you talked about, and even further, Palm Springs. So you got to really be uh, satisfied with the growth and especially with the All-Star game coming over last year as well to Ontario at, at how a non-hockey market uh, historically has now turned ever since maybe 1993 and now the American hockey league has got a hand in that as well. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th I think it's been uh, nothing short of spectacular for us. If, if you, 
you know, San Diego and Ontario are, I believe, in the top five in our league in attendance and have been for the last, uh, you know, the last several years since we moved out there. Uh, so anytime you, you know, you bring two markets in that are in your, your top four or five in a 30 team league, that's, that's real positive. And, and, uh, and I have to say going to games in San Diego, going to games in Ontario, terrific experience. Like it's a fun place to go to games. The, the rivalry between those teams is strong. Um, you know, it's, it's been terrific. And, and the other markets have been good too. Like Bakersfield is a fun place to play and, and go. And I think, the important thing for us is that all of those NHL West Bay, you know, West Coast based NHL teams are happy in the American Hockey League and they're so much happier than they were when their players were playing on the East Coast. So for, for the growth of the game, for their ability to monitor the development of their players, having them close by is, is really important. And it, it's not so much the recalls as, as being able to monitor their development on a daily basis, which obviously Anaheim can do with San Diego and Los Angeles can do with Ontario and San Jose are in the same building. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's really been good for those teams. And anytime your, your, you know, your stakeholders and your NHL partners are happier, uh, that means our league is, is, is more stable and, and more sustainable over the long haul. You said that when you were named the president and CEO, you had about a 12 month period. Well, Scott Hawson has not had that luxury. He was named uh, your successor on February 14th. So with that short time frame, what has your communication been like with him, and and have you been pre been preparing him for the role, or what has your guidance been to him? Well, I've known Scott uh, a very long time. He he actually replaced me in Cape Breton when I left, so I've only had two jobs in the last thirty three years. And uh, when I left the first one, Scott Housen was hired to replace me, and when I'm leaving the second one, he's being hired to replace me. So uh, we know each other very well. We worked together over the years in in various ways. Um, we've had actually a little bit of an advantage in, in, you know, with this current situation, it might be the only uh, good thing that's happened out of, out of this uh, suspension of play, but uh, Scott's had more time. He was going to start May 1st with us and spend two months with me uh, to prepare himself to take over July 1st. And as it turned out, uh, he was off the road with the Oilers working in his capacity with the Oilers. So we've been kind of training remotely for uh, probably probably six weeks now, at, at least maybe seven weeks, a uh, couple of hours a day I'm doing exactly what we're doing, uh, going, but we'd had a, a very structured uh, training plan for him and, and going through all the departments in our league and all of the kinds of things that I do and, and uh, in a very formal way, going through how they work um, and preparing him for, you know, everything from, from getting our payroll done to, to setting up meetings to, uh, going through all of our teams and who the key people are and, and how to interact with them to how our officiating program works to how to do player discipline to, you know, you can just go on and on. It's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. I mean, fortunately for Scott, we have a, a really terrific staff and, and all of them are in place and, and they'll be in place going forward when, uh, when he takes over. So uh, very experienced people like our, our you know, our hockey staff have been with, with me for over 10 years each. Uh, our marketing guys have been with me for 17 or 18 years. Jason's been with you, with, has been with us 17 or 18 years as well. So these people have a lot of experience, a lot of skill, take a lot of pride in their work. So, you know, Scott's coming into, if it weren't for the fact that we are uh, where we are today, uh, Scott would be coming in on July 1st to a, a pretty good situation like with, a, with a new collective bargaining agreement in place. Uh, all of our NHL agreements have been renewed. He would have had a really good chance to acclimatize himself in the job and, and have the support of all of our staff. Uh, this is now a much more difficult situation. Uh, obviously going forward, there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, so we're, you know, we're kind of working through all of that together right now. Um, and, uh, you know, he's kind of job shadowing, I guess would be the best way to put it from now until until I leave on, uh, on June 30th. Uh, but, you know, he's a smart guy. He's a lawyer. He's a, been a former GM in the National Hockey League. He's been around the HL for years. He's, he's well suited to the job. And uh, I'll be there for him uh, you know, after June 30th and for the foreseeable future. Anytime he needs help, he knows where to go. So as we look back to the week that was, well, let's first talk about the planning that went into this and the emotion as well, because uh, this obviously was no 
easy decision, but it, it was, of course, the right decision that the league made. But give us an inside look on the weeks leading up to the announcement on Monday and how everyone's reaction was to it. Well, I, I think we have to go back really to, uh, you know, to March 11th uh, and then March 12th because that, that's when this really started to uh, uh, hit home for sure. Uh, March 11th, we were in Boston with all of our staff at, a, at an off-site uh, planning meeting and followed by the Ace Bailey Foundation dinner in Boston, which is one of our uh, primary charities for the, for the league office and staff. So uh, that is kind of a big annual outing for our staff and they look forward to it. So on the 11th, we went down there and, and uh, unfortunately I had to step out of the meetings for the whole day because we were seeing signs of some of our, some of our teams uh, potentially the following weekend playing in front of empty buildings. Uh, one was San Jose, one was Providence, and there was some question in a few other markets how that might play out. Uh, so I spent the whole day on the phone with with our team presidents, uh, talked to every one of them, and uh, you know we kind of came to the conclusion by about six o'clock that night that uh, we would continue to play through the weekend. That we put our teams on the road, and those teams would play in empty buildings, and and follow proper safety procedures, uh, and. We made that decision at six o'clock by about 8.30 that night, and it might've been earlier than that, the NBA shut down. And the minute the NBA announced they were shutting down and they'd had a player test positive, uh, we, knew, we knew this was not gonna, our games were not gonna go on. I was back and forth with, with Bill Daly at the NHL to understand how they were gonna approach it. And so the next day we, we had a, the NHL met and, and uh, uh, paused their play or suspended it, whatever the term was they were using then. And, uh, and we suspended play ourselves for uh, a period of time and then later extended that to, uh, you know, to extend through May. Um, so I would say, uh, Andy, when about March 16th or 17th, I forget now, but we basically advised our teams to send the players home uh, and, and to give them an opportunity to get home while they could still travel and, and cross borders, et cetera. And uh, I think once, once we made that decision at that time, I think most of us knew uh, that it was very unlikely we would be bringing everybody back again to play uh, because we were starting to sense that this was going to be a, a, a lengthy event and would not be able to get back in the building. Um, and the CDC, I think, within a, around the same time, had put out a, what, a two month, uh, you know, a two month stay at home advisory, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's no surprise that, you know, that we shut down uh, and canceled the season on Monday. Uh, we, we, we kept the option open just because we could, like there was no pressure on us from anywhere to shut our season down in, in March or April. And uh, we said, well, let's give ourselves till May, see what's happening. And uh, once we hit, uh, I would guess around the, the last week of April, uh, we made a conscious decision as a league to really pivot towards 2020-21 uh, and, uh, and, and start to focus on how we can position ourselves and do the contingency planning that we need to do uh, to do everything we can to make sure we're able to play next year. And when we made that pivot, you know, the, we were clearly sending that message to our teams that, you know, get ready because we're, we're going to be discussing canceling the season. And uh, so we, and we talked to all of our teams last week. Uh, again, you're kind of over communicating this. <laughs> uh, Matt's heard from me more than enough, I think, Matt Savant, but uh, he would have been one of the people I talked to earlier in the week just to make sure that, uh, that we weren't gonna cause unnecessary heartburn to any of our teams by canceling, um, you know, Monday morning. So we had really unanimous support from all of those phone calls that it was probably time for teams to have the chance to, to really formally let their fans know that the season was over and, and deal with everything that went with that. Um, and all of our teams were well prepared for, for doing it. So, you know, when we had a vote on Friday night, it was a unanimous vote. It was about a 15 minute meeting, to be honest. There wasn't a lot of discussion. Everyone knew it was coming. And it was just a matter of what's, you know, what's the communication plan and, and how do we move forward? Now, that was the first time since the league's inception that a Calder Cup hasn't been awarded. Uh, quite a feat with everything that's going on in this country. And I'm sure that's not the way that you wanted to ride out your last season. But from an emotional standpoint, you have to be happy with where the league is to this point. But also, it's got to be 
a, a right decision for everybody involved too. And I'm sure that that played with your emotions, the fact that you had to do what was right for fans, players, staff, and everyone. Yeah. I mean, really it was an easy decision. And, and uh, in terms of, you know, this not playing out the way I thought it might, um, nobody's lives have played out the way they thought they might over the last nine weeks. It's not just me. So, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to make the best of it. I, I haven't had the time to really, uh, you know, feel badly about the fact that, I, that I'm just going to kind of ride off into the sunset here and probably not even see my staff face to face before I'm gone. Um, you know, that's difficult. I've worked, you know, all these years with a lot of these people and worked with our board for 26 years. I won't see them. So like all of that is, is difficult, but honestly, we're so busy uh, every day as I'm sure you, you guys are on your staff, but like we're, we're going probably 12, 13 hours a day steady here, trying to stay ahead of everything and trying to make sure that our teams know that we've got our hands on the wheel and that, and that we're, you know, proactively working towards the 2021 season. And uh, that's what we're doing. That's what all of our staff are doing. That's what all of our teams are doing. So uh, there's not a whole lot of time to worry about how it feels, you know, like, or, or anything. And, and I believe, you know, at some point we're going to be back playing. I think we'll play this coming season, whether we'll play right away in October, I'm not sure, but we're going to build a schedule for that for sure. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can play October to April. And, it, and if we can't, we're building models for playing in November, December, January, uh, making sure that our teams understand how we can do that. And uh, I, I'm very confident we're going to play next year. Like, I'm not sure what it looks like yet. But we're going to play. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. And, and we're prepared for it. Now, as you look back at your career as the president and CEO of the American Hockey League, is there one thing that you're most proud of? And it doesn't even need to be an accomplishment of something you've done. It could be keeping a good group of your staff together for over a decade or maybe a, a relationship that you built with somebody. Yeah, I, I think all of those things are, are important. I mean, it, it's kind of what happens along the trip, right? Like it's, if I look at where we are today as a league versus where we were when I started, first of all, in 26 years, you should be able to accomplish something. It's a long time, but you know, we're in a terrific spot. I mean, we, we've created a league that never existed before in, in professional hockey in terms of the, the scope and size of it and the success of it over the years. And, and, you know, 90% of our players, you know, 90% of the NHL's players having come through our league, most of their coaches, all the officials, most of the broadcasters, um, you know, the, the, the people who've gone through the league during my time, I mean, I, you can go to any NHL building any time and half of the people, more than half of the people there are guys that were in our league during my time. So that's pretty cool. We, you know, you can have all of those connections and contacts in the game. And it's been a, you know, I'm very grateful for having had the chance to do it. Um, I don't think there's any one thing that, you know, stands out to me. I think more than anything, it's kind of, the over, you know, the product of where we are today and that, you know, all of the effort that all of us have put in over the years that have been involved in this league, uh, you know, has brought us to a place where we were on, you know, on March 12th, which was really good. <laughs> like or March 11th, March 12th, no, not so good. So, uh, you know, we're, we're all going to have to regroup and, and uh, get our league back on its feet again. And, and uh, you know, I, I, we have the right people in place to do it all over the league and, and, uh, like, like I'm confident, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think we got, a, you know, we got some tough months ahead of us still, but um, I look, you know, the people I deal with in our league are also optimistic. Like they're, they're enthusiastic people and they're positive people. And, um, you know, of, of all industries, this is one of the toughest ones to be positive in right now because, because of the fact that we depend on, uh, you know, large numbers of people in, in, uh, in arenas. So, but we'll get there and we'll get there in a safe way for players and a safe way for our fans. And, um, you know, we'll, I'll look forward to somebody else being responsible for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one final thing I'd like to leave you with is uh, in your career, you've made a lot of impact in cities and that's with the people that come in game after game to watch teams that maybe never thought they would have had a team in their city or, even grateful for a time span where they had a team in their city. And you've impacted a lot of lives as well with the growth of the league. And if you want to give an outreach to the fans, because I know that you've connected with several, several fans in your career, 
uh, you can say something to the fans. I know we have San Diego fans that are watching this, but I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of American Hockey League fans watching this as well. Well, I can tell the San Diego fans that we had a, an awesome time there. With I've been down there several times, but I, I one uh, one period uh, for sure we spent about a week in San Diego and, and went to a couple of games in the building, and then I traveled, left my wife and my son and his uh, and his wife in a, in a rented house for a week, and I did the California circuit and kept coming back to another another Gulls game, but. Um, we loved it there and people were so friendly like the fans yeah, that doesn't happen in every building the fans would some they saw me drop the puck or whatever so they'd they'd wander over and chat and say hello and and uh it was really fun and then of course ran into willie o'ree every time i was in the building i'd run into willie in the concourse and willie and i are from the same neck of the woods in canada and have been friends for a long time so always great to see him but you know, you, you guys are doing an, an awesome job. Like, you know, Matt Savant, everyone there, your whole staff have been phenomenal. And, uh, you know, you can see the connection that your fans have to the to the team and, and to the organization. So, you know, it's, it's great. And, you know, all over the league, like not every time I'm in a building, is it always a, a love-in? There's, you know, sometimes the officials aren't as good as the home team's fans would like them to be. And, and you hear about that a lot. But uh, mostly in, in, in the American League, people are very kind. Like when you're in the building, you know, the, the season ticket holders, especially that have been around for a while, they, they always come up and chat. And, uh, you know, that's the fun part of the job. It's been, it's been awesome. All right, David Andrews, president and CEO, only for about another month and a half. I appreciate your time. I appreciate what you've done. Uh, I've gotten to know you out of the past six, seven years, and it's been a pleasure getting to know you and seeing your hard work firsthand. So thank you for that. Great. Thanks, Andy. Take care.